all the congregation of Israel, that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new, new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory, Glory to, you. to you, O Lord. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do not my feet, not, on, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, who have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my, di my disciples, if you love, you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth 
and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and are for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Thy blood and righteousness, thy beauty are my glorious dress. Mid flaming worlds in these array, with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day. Cleanse and redeem no debt to pay, fully absolved through these I am, from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Lord, I believe thy precious blood, which at the mercy seat of God leads for the captive's liberty, was also shed in love for me. Lord, I believe for sinners more than sands upon the ocean shore. Thou hast for all a ransom paid, for all a fall atonement made. When from the dust of death I rise, to claim my mansion in the skies, this then shall be my only plea. Jesus hath lived and died for me. Jesus be endless grace to thee, whose boundless mercy hath for me, for me and all thy hands have an everlasting ransom Good evening, members of Emmanuel Lutheran. The meditation for this evening continues to follow that theme of summarizing the gospel in seven words. 
Jesus comes to feed my hungry soul. If I had to summarize Monday Thursday with seven words, that's what I'd say. Jesus comes to feed my hungry soul. And make no mistake, my soul, and I have the feeling your soul too, is hungry. Hunger is a universal experience, right? We all understand the need to feed our bodies. Every day throughout the day, our bodies work hard. They labor constantly, simply to keep us alive and moving. And because of that work, our bodies constantly need rejuvenation. They constantly need refueling. Back in high school biology, we learned all about digestion and metabolism and caloric consumption. But those concepts only name the sensation that all of us experience. Even the youngest baby knows the pains of a stomach that needs to be filled. The simple fact is that we must eat to stay alive. Our bodies must receive regular and continual nourishment. So do our souls. The human soul, I'm talking about the part of us that isn't located in a specific organ, but that no one denies is real and a central component of who we are, also needs nourishment. Like our bodies, our souls grow weary. Like our bodies, our souls tire out and wear down. Stress and strain and the struggles we face in a sin-fallen world take their toll. As a result, we experience a different kind of hunger. We experience an emptiness in our souls that needs to be filled. This is not a uniquely Christian idea. Just about everyone seems to understand this basic human need. Take Adele Ryan McDowell, for example. Adele Ryan McDowell is a psychotherapist who teaches meditation and transformational healing. With a PhD in psychology, she writes books and speaks at conferences across the country. And significantly, for our purposes tonight, it's important to note that she's not a Christian. In 2009, she wrote an article called 50 Ways to Feed Your Soul. In it, she emphasized the need to replenish our souls so that we might live meaningful and fulfilling lives. The article offers 50 suggestions for how to do this. I'll share a few with you. Number one, have a pillow fight. Number two, take a walk in the forest. Number four, smell a rose. Number five, smell a baby. Number 19, make snow angels. Number 20, swim with dolphins. Number 32, sing in the shower. Number 44, finger paint. Number 49, play with a puppy. Do these things, she says, and you will feed your hungry soul. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good pillow fight. I love walking in the woods, and babies smell great, except when they smell really, really bad. But I read these suggestions for nourishing my soul, and they seem so hollow, so barren. They seem so inadequate for the real struggles, the real difficulties we face in life. In the end, playing with a puppy isn't going to do anything to help us face the serious and deeply troubling problems, problems that wear us down. McDowell has a few other ideas, however. Some of them, at first glance, appear more substantive. Number 38, talk with the angels. Although she doesn't say anything about how to do this or what to say to them. Number seven, surrender to love. Although she doesn't tell us what love looks like or how to surrender to it. Number 30, forgive yourself for everything. Now this one is worth stopping to consider. Forgive yourself, she says, and in saying so, she recognizes that we need to be forgiven. Our souls are weary for a variety of reasons. They are weary because of the way others have treated us. They are weary because of the relentless pace, the rat race, rat race we've made of life. They are weary because of dreams left unmet and because we failed to achieve our lost, lofty aspirations. Oftentimes, due to no direct fault of our own, life beats down our souls and wears us out. 
Of course, it's not just the external forces. Our souls are also wearied by that which comes from within. Discontentment, anger, fear, guilt. Our own brokenness continually lets us down. Our own limitations repeatedly remind us of our failings. Ultimately, the source of our weariness comes down to one thing and one thing alone, our own sinful condition. Do you remember Psalm 32? Psalm 32 describes one who, rather than confessing his sin, languishes in shame and guilt. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. His soul was parched. It was desperately in need of nourishment. McDowell was right about one thing. Our souls need to be fed with forgiveness. But her suggestion about where we find forgiveness is one of the greatest and most prevalent lies today. Forgive yourself, she says. But that's not possible. The simple fact is that forgiveness can't be found from within because our sin is not at its foundation against ourselves. Our sin is first and foremost against God, and therefore only God can forgive. Tonight, on the night Jesus was betrayed, we recall a very special meal. It was a meal God himself had arranged. A meal God himself commanded Moses and the people of Israel to eat as a remembrance of how he delivered them from slavery in Egypt. For generations, the people of God had been eating and drinking this meal and thanking God for what he had done to save them. But on this particular night, the night that Jesus was betrayed, our Lord transformed this very special meal that recalls God's deliverance into a meal that, quite literally, feeds our souls. That's what Martin Luther called it in his large catechism as he was trying to describe what God is doing in the Lord's Supper. He calls this bite of bread and this sip of wine food for the soul. This food for the soul is a different kind of meal. We eat and drink this meal with our mouths. We chew it and swallow it and digest the bread and the wine. But in this meal, God promises more than physical nourishment. Listen again to how Matthew described it. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Food for the soul, bread and wine, body and blood, poured out for many, poured out for you. With this meal, God provides for us the very thing for which our souls are longing. He offers us his forgiveness, his life, his salvation. He gives us his very self to sustain and nourish us for our struggle in this tiresome and trying existence. Throughout this season of Lent, we've been thinking about how we could summarize the good news of Jesus. We've been trying to describe the gospel using only seven words. Tonight, we'll put it like this. On this Monday, Thursday, on this night which Jesus, on which Jesus was betrayed, on this night when he ate and drank with his disciples, on this night that took him to the hall of the high priest and the palace of Pontius Pilate, and ultimately to the hill outside Jerusalem, on this night, when Jesus gave himself for us to eat and drink, Jesus comes and he gives us his body and his blood in bread and wine. Jesus comes and he presents himself among us and for us and in us. Jesus comes to our weary souls, our tired souls, our hungry souls, and he sustains us and nourishes us and strengthens us for our struggle through this valley of tears. Sisters and brothers, 
That's the gospel. That's the good news on this Monday, Thursday, and every time we gather around the table, Jesus comes to feed my hungry soul. In Jesus' name, amen. On this night, Jesus gave his church a new commandment to love one another as he has loved us. And then he washed his disciples' feet before he offered himself on the cross in perfect love. Therefore, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy Lord, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your son's death until he comes. Grant us boldness and joy then to proclaim your son's death, for his death gives life to this dying world. Be with all pastors and missionaries who proclaim Christ crucified in this and every land. Where there is despair, bring hope. Where there is guilt, bring forgiveness. Where there is pain, bring help. And where there is persecution, bring joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, Peter would have had no share with your son unless your son washed his feet. Help us to treasure our baptism each and every day, for your Son has washed more than our feet, but has washed both body and soul of all our sins, so that we now abide in him and he in us. Keep us in our baptism until it is completed in the resurrection of our bodies, when we will live in the light of his glory forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, you hold the world in your hands, so give all nations good and honest leaders who govern according to your commands. Bestow peace in every land so that your gospel has free course. Grant wisdom and integrity to our president, governor, congress, 
and all who make and minister and judge our laws so that they promote justice, defend the weak, reward virtue, and punish evil. Guard and protect all who serve in the armed forces, including B.J. Anderson, Matthew Riley, Caleb Suhu, and Pastor Joshua Schneider. Bless their families with your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, your Son touched those who were ill and healed them. Be merciful to those who suffer from being shut in at home, those who are sick from the coronavirus, and those who are addicted in any way. Grant them healing according to your good and gracious will. Help them to bear their affliction with patience, knowing that you will fully restore them in both body and soul when you make all things new on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are present in the sacrament of the Eucharist. We love you above all things, and we long to receive the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Since we cannot presently receive you in your sacrament, come spiritually into our hearts. Grant to us in due season and according to your great kindness, so again to share in the celebration and to receive the sacrament of your body and blood, that we may know the joy of being fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Until that time, nourish us with your word, strengthen our faith, and conform our lives to yours. Bless us and your whole church as we pray, as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. At the prosperous, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it.